Well, amazingly enough, this is where it all started at what used to be the Rochester Junior Chamber of Commerce, 55 St. Paul Street, downtown Rochester. An idea was conceived for a large singing organization. And thanks to the hard work of the JCs and a very enthusiastic young conductor, the Rochester Oratorio Society was born. That's right. Now, the very first rehearsal was on a Monday evening in September of 1945 in a small room at the Eastman School of Music. The organizers expected about 100 singers. 250 people showed up for that first rehearsal. This was the beginning of a tradition that would last for more than 50 years. Hi, I'm Brenda Tremblay. And I'm Rich Becker. Welcome to the 50th anniversary celebration of the Rochester Oratorio Society. This year, the ROS celebrates 50 years of singing. From Handel to Verdi, old friends and new, the ROS Baton calls together singers of all walks of life who sing purely out of their love for music. That's right. You know, singing makes us happy. And the joy of performance gives singers and instrumentalists the opportunity to present the great choral masterworks to the Rochester public. In celebration of our 50th year, we want to recognize the hard work and the fruits of our success. We want to remember the history of the Rochester Oratorio Society. And we want to memorialize the people who made it all happen. The year 1945 was one of victory and celebration. World War II was finally drawing to a close. May 8th saw VE Day and three months later, on August 15th, victory in Japan. With the war finally over and victory ringing in the air, it's no wonder that people's thoughts turned to singing. The Oratorio Society was conceived in the minds of engineers at the Taylor Instrument Company. They were members of their own company's chorus under the direction of a young conductor by the name of Johannes Theodor Hallenbach. The singing engineers proposed beginning a true community chorus dedicated to the performance of large-scale choral literature, and they wanted Ted Hollenbach to conduct it. Mr. Hollenbach gladly accepted the challenge. The Rochester Junior Chamber of Commerce acknowledged the long-felt need for the establishment of a large singing organization and enthusiastically offered their financial and administrative support. The JCs formed an advisory committee to aid the society. With Dr. Howard Hansen, director of the Eastman School of Music and well-known composer, the Oratorio Society was off to a great start. Hundreds of people responded to the call for auditions, from high school students to retirees. The society members, all carefully selected for musical ability and background, made up a chorus of nearly 300 voices. That first year, the Rochester Oratorio Society had their members lustily singing in their first concert. They performed Handel's Messiah in Strong Auditorium on December 30th, 1945. When I first started out 50 years ago, we were at the Junior Chamber of Commerce on St. Paul Street. It was a huge hall, and there were 300 voices, and the first time I heard that group, I, it really was remarkable. It was such a gorgeous sound. I just had to sit and listen for about five minutes before I could actually could sing. In 1946, the Society relocated their second performance of Messiah from Strong Auditorium to the Eastman Theater because the demand for tickets was so great. It was at this time that the JCs recorded the following noteworthy statement, quote, It is the hope of the society to make Messiah an annual Christmas time event. The society was the center of attention. Not only were they obliged to switch venues because of the popularity of their Christmas program, but the men of the group were invited to sing in Liszt's Faust Symphony with tenor Romulo de Spirito, the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, and Leonard Bernstein conducting. The Rochester Oratorio Society was expanding and maturing as quickly as post-war Rochester. The city and surrounding areas were experiencing 
an almost phenomenal growth in commerce, finance, and industry from the end of the war to around 1970, especially in comparison to the rest of the Northeast. However, with the advent of television, Ned Sullivan, and various popular contemporary entertainment, the attendance at legitimate theater and other forms of performing arts went into decline. The membership of the Oratorio Society, however, has always been what some have called tenacious. Monday night at 7.30, rehearsals and Messiah performances continued nonetheless, utilizing any space available, including rooms in the Chamber of Commerce. One of the first memories uh, of the ROS was the rehearsals at the Powers Hotel, when the chorus members used to sit on the stairs and uh, everybody be around Ted and had to lean on side to side to try to get a picture of him conducting. 1948, the fourth season of the Society's existence marked the first appearance of local baritone William Warfield. This was the beginning of a long and prosperous association for both the young singer and the fledgling chorus. Mr. Warfield, who was at that time acting and directing the background music for the Theater Guild production of Set My People Free, sang Messiah with the Society that season and many thereafter. He did wonders as Elijah in Mendelssohn's oratorio and also appeared in Franz Liszt's Christus and Haydn's Creation. A graduate of the prestigious Eastman School, Mr. Warfield was destined to go on to even greater things. He toured Africa, the Near East, and Europe, performed at recitals worldwide, and appeared on Broadway. The Rochester Oratorio Society's reputation grew as a result of such renowned soloists. The Rochester Oratorio Society was the... Uh, was, uh was the, the training ground for, for me when I really uh, did oratorio. I learned my first Messiah, I learned my first Elijah, I learned uh, St. Matthew Passion, I learned the, 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 all of these things in Rochester. I'm very grateful for my beginnings of oratorio, were with the Oratorio Society, and then when I got into a full career, it was a uh, second nature to me. Ted used to have a lot of fun going down to New York to actually listen and audition the different stars. And uh, I remember Justino Diaz, he was great fun to work with. But of course, uh, really and truly, I've enjoyed William Warfield a great deal. I remember, uh, especially as Elijah, no one could do it like he did. I mean, he made you really think he was Elijah, and we reacted to that, believe me. It was really a wonderful, wonderful concert. The Korean War broke out in 1950. As a result of these hostilities, approximately 20,000 young men and women from Rochester and Monroe County responded to the call to service. By 1955, 176 of our young people had given the ultimate sacrifice in defense of America. The Oratorio Society suffered a drop in membership as a result of the war, as did many other organizations throughout Rochester and the surrounding counties. However, fewer members could not deter Ted Hollenbach. And we did diminish in numbers uh, through the years, but nothing low, lower, I believe, than uh, 170. And of course, smaller groups too you are easier to control, so we were able to do some beautiful work. To commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Rochester Oratorio Society, Ted prepared Mendelssohn's Elijah with soprano Virginia Cole, alto Margaret Sauvé, tenor Giles Hoban, baritone William Warfield, and treble Richard Wilder. Ted Hollenbach, so fond of music in large scale, conducted the second American performance of Hector Berlioz's Requiem in April of 1954 in honor of that composer's 150th birthday. He never gave a dull performance, and even though the news critic, newspaper critics often uh, 
didn't agree with his interpretations, uh, they couldn't fault him for putting his own personal stamp on things. And uh, that's the thing I'll remember the most about his performances. By this year, the Oratorio Society no longer required the financial support of the JCs. In order to fund the Berlioz concert, a grossly expensive concert for the times with a budget of $4,000, the Oratorio Society merely intended to sell out the Eastman Theater. Rochester seemed to have a difficult time understanding what it was that kept society members struggling away every Monday night for months at a time. A rehearsal of the Oratorio Society means stiff competition from television, the radio, the movies. But so far, as the members are concerned, it's more fun to sing than it is to see a show. They're willing to strain and perspire and repeat phrases over and over to meet Theodore Hollenbach's standard. And Theodore Hollenbach had high standards indeed. As the son of a Methodist minister and an amateur musician, he was exposed to the effect of music on the everyday lives of people from an early age. Ted learned to play the piano and violin from his mother, and by the age of 12 was playing the organ and singing as a boy soprano in his father's church. He began directing church choir when he was only 15. Born in Brooklyn in 1916, he spent most of his childhood in Lawrence, Massachusetts. His father was appointed minister to the former Emanuel Methodist Episcopal Church in Rochester during Ted's senior year, and as a result, he graduated from Rochester's Benjamin Franklin High School. From there, he attended Houghton College, where he received his degree in conducting. Shortly after arriving at the Eastman School for his graduate studies, Ted found himself very much in demand in the Rochester area as a conductor. Over the years, Ted accumulated many diverse conducting experiences. He taught conducting and voice methods at Nazareth College and directed the U of R Glee Club and marching band during World War II. In addition to the Oratorio Society, Ted founded and directed the Rochester Bach Chorus and Festival and the Corning Philharmonic Orchestra. He also directed the Corning Glassworks Glee Club and the Third Presbyterian Church Choir, occasionally appearing as guest conductor with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. His conducting repertoire encompassed opera, operetta, symphony, and even ballet. Although, much to his chagrin, Ted was primarily known as a conductor of chorus and, by association oratorio, his horizons were much broader than that. Held in high regard by both the community and by his peers, Ted provided Rochester with the opportunity to hear the great choral masterworks, including the first Rochester performance of the Bach B minor Mass in 1955, a uh, performance remembered as the night the Eastman Theater roof collapsed. The second-ever United States performance of Franz Liszt's Christus, Orff's Carmina Burana in 1958, Honegger's Joan of Arc in 1961, and, of course, the Berlioz Requiem. He was a major influence in the budding careers of many promising young singers, most notably Jan Vickers, Benita Valence, Justino Diaz, and William Warfield. Ted knew how to pick soloists. He would go to New York to pick soloists, and he would pick young soloists whose career had not blossomed. And he, many of the soloists that we had in the early days then went on to become famous. Ted was a recipient of the Mahler Bruckner Society's Mahler Medal. And later in October of 1985, Ted was ceremoniously recognized when Arts for Greater Rochester honored him for his significant contributions to the arts in Rochester. Ted's goal for the Rochester Oratorio Society, to reveal to the Rochester public the, in his words, inexhaustible wealth of choral music that awaits only the touch of the skilled musician to make its inspiration known. With the first performance of the Barrios Requiem in 1954, Ted and the Oratorio Society were well on their way toward achieving that goal. 
It was a work so well performed, it was recorded on Columbia Records the following year to receive rave reviews. The critics praised Ted as a conductor to be watched and that he knew how to bring the best out of his large amateur chorus, singing with cohesion, balance, and wealth of tone. I don't think any time that Ted was, did not have a vision of what he wanted the chorus to sound like and how he wanted us to sing. And he had that vision in his, in his mind, and he fought to have us produce that. David J. Oppenheim of Columbia Records praised the Berlioz recording venture, quote, as the result of a strictly community enterprise. And Oppenheim went on to say that enough people have heard about the Berlioz Requiem to fill the Eastman Theater for two performances, raise enough money to finance a recording, and Rochester has received a great deal of favorable publicity. A triumph such as this might only be followed by Gustav Mahler's Symphony of a Thousand. In 1956, the Democratic Chronicle noted that, quote, Rochester has a conductor with the ambition and enough depth and breadth of musical resources to do justice to this extraordinary work. Uh, there are many pieces that he did with the ROS that probably uh, couldn't have been done without his determination. Um, and one in particular I remember is the Mahler Eighth Symphony that he conducted, uh, where there was some fear by the officials of the University of Rochester that the Eastman stage wouldn't hold all of the people needed for the performance. And so they were ready to cancel the performance. Uh, but Ted, through his determination, sought out the architects of the Eastman Theater and uh, asked them whether the stage would indeed hold that many people. And he was told that uh, he could probably line up a layer of steam locomotives and add another layer on top of that, and the Eastman Theater stage would still hold. So due to his determination, the performance went on. Back when I started, the oratorio was really the only game in town. Uh, it gave so many of us who were just amateur singers a chance to be on the Eastman stage and do some really wonderful works. Uh, I was really thrilled every time I got on the Eastman stage. 1957, Sputnik is launched. 1958, local public broadcasting is born and the construction of Midtown Plaza marks the era of a metropolitan Rochester. Neighborhood associations begin to form. In 1961, Haloid Xerox became the Xerox Corporation. Contrasting the growth and development of Rochester's cultural identity, the tensions of cultures and races colliding, striving for their own voices to be heard. De facto segregation in the schools was the issue in 1963, and in July of 1964, riots broke out in Rochester's inner-city neighborhoods. The year of the Oratorio Society's 25th anniversary, Neil Armstrong made his one small step. The Oratorio Society kept on performing throughout every season, every winter with the Messiah, and every spring and fall with other inspiring works. Ted Hollenbach was noted for asserting that he tried to do one new work each year. His claim was that he didn't pamper the group at all. He was very tough on them. To get 200 amateurs to respond musically and rhythmically, it takes discipline. Hollenbach and the Society worked very hard because, as Ted used to say, he didn't want to be a part of anything that is a mess. Many people that were in the chorus were um, music school teachers, um, semi-professionals in that way, and other singers in other choruses. And the chorus really um, was as good as any chorus in the, in the United States that was even some of those that were professional choruses. I think the group has always had a lot of um, strength. Certainly everyone who comes to sing is um, an amateur in the best sense of the word that we sing for the love of it.
During the summer of 1981, the Oratorio Society visited Paris, France, where Ted conducted the famous Lamoureux Orchestra, soloists, and the combined efforts of the Oratorio Society, the Choral Arts Society of Washington, D.C., and the Mendelssohn Club of Philadelphia. They performed Rossini's demanding Stabat Mater. Uh, people didn't know each other too much until they went to Europe for the first time, and then we made lots of friends being together for three weeks and rehearsing and touring and uh, sharing the <laughs> rough moments as well as the great moments uh, really got us to know each other much mm. better than we had in the past. And I think the social aspect has been a wonderful aspect of keeping oratorio going. I would say that was one of my most memorable times Ted had led us in the stop at, Rossini's Stab at Mater in Notre Dame. Then we went to Salzburg and did the Mozart Requiem in Mozart's church, the Collegium Church. Oh, what a, what a great trip that was. Two years later, in June of 1983, the European Symposium of Choral Masterworks invited Ted to conduct the Verdi Requiem in the Chiesa di San Anastasia in Verona, Italy, during the annual European Festival Concerts. In 1984, the city of Rochester celebrated her sesquicentennial year. Fireworks, parades, a ball, and a salute to the Erie Canal were all part of the festivities planned to commemorate Rochester's 150 years as a city. Needless to say, the Oratorio Society, along with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra and Rochester's own William Warfield and Thomas Paul, added magic of their own in an official ceremony held at City Hall with a performance of Verdi's Requiem on April 28th of 1984. In the 1985-86 season, when Ted was honored for his efforts by the Arts for Greater Rochester, he raised his baton one final time after 40 years as director of the Oratorio Society. The group now faced the arduous task of selecting a replacement. This wasn't easy considering the influence Ted had had on the chorus over the years. and Many thought that the group would disperse. There was a little bit of uh, decrease in morale, I think, it was perfectly uh, expected. I was included in that. I thought the group was going to go under. We all thought that. Uh, but then somehow it was saved, and uh, Roger came along, and uh, I thought things got back on track rather quickly. In June of 1986, after an extensive search, the Oratorio Society announced the appointment of Dr. Roger Wilhelm as its new director. Roger had a most impressive background and was already well known in the Rochester area. He possessed the qualities necessary to lead a massive organization with such a rich and fulfilling history. Born in Buffalo, New York, Roger was educated at Northwestern University, where he began his studies as a pre-law student. His love for music, however, influenced a change in his curriculum. He completed his bachelor's degree in music with a major in voice and a master's degree in music history. Roger also attended the University of California at Berkeley for musicology and received his doctorate of music arts from Stanford. Roger's teaching experience was very extensive. He taught for two years at Kendall College and in 1968 he became director of choral studies at the University of North Dakota. In 1973 he moved to Rochester to become the director of choral activities at the River Campus of the University of Rochester. He also accepted the position of Associate Professor of Conducting at the Eastman School of Music. In 1977, he progressed to Director of Music for the University of Rochester. In 1981, Roger was appointed as Director of Music for Asbury First United Methodist Church. And then soon after, in 1986, he was selected to be our new conductor. I was very impressed with, with the energy that came out of this group. And so that in the middle 80s, when uh, Ted retired from the position, uh, it was kind of a natural for me to apply for the position. We thought when we left the Eastman that uh, nothing could ever be as great as being there. And there, there is a wonderful feeling of being on the Eastman stage and performing to that house. But there's also a wonderful feeling of doing 
a candlelight performance of Messiah at Asbury. In November of 1986, Roger made his ROS debut conducting the Haydn creation. He continued with the tradition of performing the Messiah at Christmas time each year, as well as major works for the chorus. In March of 1987, the performance of King David with William Warfield narrating was very well received. The season finale, however, proved to be something quite different for everyone. Favorite chorus scenes from opera were performed. In contrast to Ted, Roger began to introduce some of the more light-hearted literature available for large choruses. This offered variety and made the concert series more attractive to community patrons. Other concerts in future seasons characterized by this approach were by popular request, Classical Meets Jazz, and PDQ Box, The Seasonings. The 1987-1988 season brought more exciting music for the rejuvenated chorus. They performed Britain's St. Nicholas and Schubert's G Major Mass as a season opener. Robert Palmer, a Democrat and Chronicle music critic, said that Wilhelm's programming is to be most commended for the more adventurous side that brought St. Nicholas to Rochester audiences for what may well be the first time in 15 years. He asserts that Wilhelm has proven that tried and true is not always what fills the soul or the house. Salieri's Te Deum and Mozart's Regina Chaley and Requiem could be heard echoing throughout the halls of Asbury in March of 88. In May, the Oratorio Society performed at Brighton High School with the Senior Chorus and Wind Ensemble. For this election year, they performed Randall Thompson's The Testament of Freedom and Songs of Our Politics, arranged by Roger himself. Through Roger's adventurous spirit, the chorus was exposed to new works such as Vaughn Williams' Dona Nobis Pacem, Ives' The Celestial Country, Haydn's Nelson Mass, Dvorak Mass in D Major, St. San Christmas Oratorio, and other favorites such as Rudder's Requiem and Mendelssohn's Elijah. Roger has done a really great job of promoting repertoire that isn't heard a lot. And I think from a musical point of view, the group has been very stretched and challenged by some of the pieces that we've done. And I think as a result, every time we perform, we're more confident and we're able to do more interesting pieces, in addition to the really well-loved pieces like The Messiah and uh, Mendelssohn's Elijah, for instance. Elijah, performed in the spring of 1990, marked the beginning of the final decade of the 20th century, a true landmark. 45 years after the first eager responses to a call for a large choral performing group, the enthusiasm and commitment of the Oratorio Society's members has not waned. That summer, members of the group, as well as many community members, toured Europe. They sang in such places as Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. The Oratorio Society is always searching for new opportunities to join with other musical groups to present combined concerts. In 1991, the chorus joined with the Penfield Symphony Orchestra to perform Brahms Requiem and Academic Festival Overture. Um, another goal of mine was to uh, reestablish a relationship with the RPO which uh, we have done uh, marvelously in the last couple of years and in foreseeable years in the future. Just such a joint venture took place in the Eastman Theater in January of 1992. The chorus was asked by the RPO to sing for a multimedia presentation of The Magic of the Olympics, narrated by Rafer Johnson and Jackie Joyner Kersey. This was a truly inspiring event heralded on by the music of Verdi and Berlioz. In March of that same year, the Oratorio Society and the RPO tackled another challenging situation, a live movie soundtrack. It was Alexander Nevsky, written by Sergei Eisenstein, with music by Sergei Prokofiev. The movie was originally released in 1938. Many attended this benefit concert for the RPO Musicians' Pension Fund and were pleasantly struck by the power of film and live music together. In 1993, the group made another trip across the Atlantic, this time to the British Isles, performing Verne's Solemn Mass, John Brown's Opera Kirk Meacham, and selected choruses from American sacred music. The Oratorio Society crossed the Canadian border to London, Ontario in 1995 to perform Mozart's Grand Mass in C minor in an exchange program with the London Fanshawe Symphonic Chorus. The London Chorus, in turn, traveled to Rochester to perform. Many new friends and musical ties were made during those two weekends that will not soon be forgotten. Roger Wilhelm has done a very good job of uh, reforming the chorus into a much leaner, uh, tighter group. I think um, the quality continues to improve of the, the concerts that I've attended. And uh, I think that his strategies in these lean times for all the arts uh, are good ones. Uh, and certainly now the oratorio has branched out into other areas that it hasn't before, and I think it's gotten really good response from the community.
The creativity of the Oratorio Society doesn't end with the performances that are seen by the public. It takes funding to make them happen, whether they be joint concerts with other groups or the Messiah. In the past, the chorus has had to resort to other forms of fundraising that would be attractive and entertaining to the public, as well as beneficial. In 1992, Sweet Sounds was introduced and was a roaring success. It was such a success that the same fundraiser was produced in the following two years. The event highlighted by a small jazz ensemble for entertainment, a silent auction as well as a live auction, a wine tasting and many delectable desserts to tempt anyone. Another necessary fundraiser was the barn sale, which for many years, due to the efforts of its chair people and volunteers, helped the chorus stay afloat. Shoppers and collectors from all over came to Evelyn Fleming's barn to see what kind of bargains they could take home. The community, however, is the mainstay of the Oratorio Society. Without it, there would be no chorus. In an effort to give back some of the support they give to the group, the Society shares its celebration of the holiday seasons by singing at the county office building to open its holiday concert series, and also at the Presbyterian home on Thurston Road. Many members also donate their time during the WXXI auction, answering phones or filling in wherever help may be needed. This might come as a surprise to many people. The Rochester Oratorio office was first created in 1990, and many people might not know it exists right in the lower level of Asbury First United Methodist Church, right around the corner from Fellowship Hall, where you rehearse every Monday night. I hope that some of, some of the young people out there will stay with ROF and will come and work on any project that we have. We have to raise money to keep this organization going, and we need volunteers to help us raise this money. Our dues, it, it doesn't cover the expenses, nor do the ticket sales, so we need volunteers to come forward. So I hope that the young people that are now singing with us will stay and will take at least, there'll be another Elise and Betty Joy <laughs> in, in another 25 uh. years. Um, so to everyone, a happy 50th anniversary. The last 50 years have been, uh, have has been a tremendous opportunity in the community. We've brought so much to the community. And I think the next 50, and uh, as characterized by Carrie Radcliffe's uh, world premiere coming up tomorrow night at Hochstein, uh, is just the beginning of, of the excitement for the next 50 years. For the 50th year celebration, the Oratorio Society is performing Carrie Radcliffe's Ode to Common Things. The work was commissioned specifically for the occasion. The group has risen to the challenge of performing a new piece of music never before heard. With its intricate rhythms and interwoven harmonies, Ode to Common Things is musically charged and inspires everyone to give their all. On March 23, 1996, a symposium was held at Nazareth College. The topics of the discussion included the poet Pablo Neruda, on whose poem the work is based, the creative process of Kerry Radcliffe in composing the music, and how the two elements came together as a final work. A light reception was held afterwards. Uh, it's been a great uh, experience working on this piece. We've been in the planning stages for uh, over a year, and finally it's coming to uh, fruition here. And it's been a real honor working with this group. Uh, uh, it's 50th uh, anniversary. I'm hoping that uh, it will be uh, uh, a little crowning achievement for, uh, uh, for this year and the way that this uh, uh, community, really, of musicians pulls together uh, in this and uh, that it will be uh, something that will take them on into their next uh, uh, 50 years. So what does the future hold for the Rochester Oratorio Society? As far as the future goes, um, I think all arts, performing arts groups are facing very serious problems in the next decade. Musical uh, audiences, opera audiences, theater audiences are beginning to, uh, to dwindle. I, I, I'm looking in the future to, to try to combine the best sense of entertainment with works, these great works of art. Now, that might mean uh, that some concerts will be multimedia. I think we have to be creative in, in trying to uh, draw an interest uh, of people who may not have had the background that, uh, that uh, uh, citizens had, say, 50 years ago in the arts. We are starting to get some younger people coming in. 
Uh, we're doing more community uh, outreach type programs. And I think we're getting big, better known in the community. We broaden our audience and we get more financial support. I would love to see us tour um, more frequently. I'd love to see us do some educational programs for, for youth in the greater Rochester area. And uh, I'd also like to see us do more concerts with the uh, Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra and to, to sing to packed audiences um, in the Eastman Theater. Um, certainly, um, it would be great someday to have our own singing venue. That would be a wonderful opportunity for us. Um, generally, I think the future is very bright, and I certainly want to be a part of it as long as I can. And indeed, the Oratorio Society is thrilled to take on the future with such a notable musician as director. Roger Wilhelm's reputation has reached the eyes and ears of the Rochester chapter of Mu Phi Epsilon, an international music fraternity. This chapter has been giving awards to outstanding musicians since 1962. And in November of 1996, Roger will be receiving their prestigious Musician of the Year Award. Well, there you have it. Our first 50 years have been filled with a passion of music that we all share. That passion continues today and on into the next 50. I hope we were able to tell you something about the richness of our past and to celebrate our history at the same time. A history that's about people who through their talents share a love of music and bring pride to the community. As musicians and as people who love music, whatever level of performance we're at, I do think every performance um, brings something special to our lives and I think we come away changed as individuals. And I really appreciate the Oratorio Society for that. Uh, it was really a wonderful experience in my life to meet the fine members of the chorus and to have established great friendships that have lasted many, many years and uh, friendships I still uh, cherish to this day. It's, it's just been a great time. Uh, there have been times in my professional life where uh, things may have been a little bit rocky, but being able to come here and share my experiences and sing with uh, my good friends here with, with this organization and has really made a big difference and had a, a very important impact upon my life. Our group, I think, is quite remarkable when you stop to think of all the different types of people who sing, uh, young and middle-aged and older like myself, and some of our experiences have been terrific over the years and we come from all different walks of life and we truly have made some wonderful friendships.